This episode is brought to you in part by Anato. Uh, look, you guys know I am a huge proponent of community-based clinical research sites. Uh, I truly believe that the future relies on them. Unfortunately, a lot of small sites have not had access to the same resources that larger uh, clinical trial sites have. Fortunately, Anato is here to help. Uh, they provide a, an entirely free platform uh, that empowers community-based research sites all around the globe with access and unheard levels of visibility to clinical trial opportunities. Uh, you can see open or upcoming trials as far as 12 months in advance, and uh, you have tools and features to help you make sure you're picking the right trials for your site and for your patients. Uh, look, we oftentimes we spend a lot of time spinning our wheels, trying to sort of have a shotgun approach, uh, so it's really great to have Anato uh, provide tools to make sure you're not wasting your time and energy. Anato's advocates help you showcase for sponsors your diverse patient population, community engagement efforts, uh, diverse staff, and whatever else makes your site unique and stand out. So, look, sign up. It only takes two minutes. That's anato.com. I-N-A-T-O dot com. Hello and welcome to the Note to File podcast, a collection of interviews, best practices, and candid conversation for clinical research sites. I'm your host, Brad Hightower. Our guest this week is Brittany Sloan. Brittany is the director of Black Research Matters, a safe space exclusively for black people to learn more about research with the purpose of becoming better informed decision makers, thus strengthening the community by using knowledge as a tool to navigate the medical and healthcare systems. Uh, this week, we finally made it. Uh, as the episode is the conclusion of the three-part series on the Tuskegee syphilis experiments uh, presented uh, solely by Brittany. So uh, I want to thank you guys for hanging in there. I'm glad we were able to get through all three. Uh, if you're listening uh, prior to May 16th or even afterwards, make sure to come check out the live stream uh, Brittany and I will do uh, that also references and discusses the, the Tuskegee syphilis experiments. That is May 16th at noon Eastern. Uh, either way, without further ado, Brittany Sloan. All right, welcome back, Brittany Sloan, for part three uh, of our series about uh, the Tuskegee experiment. I'm happy to have you back. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here again. And uh, let's just get right to it, man. I'm going to yeah, let, uh, let you go. <laughs> Thank you. So hello again. Uh, my name is Brittany. I'm from Black Research Matters. And Black Research Matters is a safe space uh, free of criticism and judgment for Black people to learn more about research with the purposes of uh, strengthening the community, the Black community, by enhancing the power of informed decision making. We started this series last year in the spring, so a year ago, and we're finally beginning to conclude the series. Um, unfortunately, a few days after we recorded the uh, second episode in August, my father unexpectedly passed away. And for me personally, the trauma of losing a parent has been hugely life-changing um, initially and still now. It's only been like eight months, I think, and it's, it's a difficult road. But I have to say that also, it's been incredibly transformative in a huge number of positive ways. I always knew I was coming back to Black Research Matters. My dad loved it. He was very proud of the work that we were doing. And he's a lot of the reason I created the organization. As I think about it in hindsight, he definitely was my muse for the organization. And so with that, I want to say that I want to thank everyone for their patience. Thank you to Brad and the Note to File podcast staff for having us again and and honestly, it just feels really good to be um, seen and heard again. So thank you. Yeah, no, of course. Anytime. You know, my condolences. We're glad to have you back. Thank you. So as we've introed before, this is a special project. It's a three-part series in an effort to break down the Tuskegee syphilis study. Most listening to this podcast have an affiliation with clinical research, and with that, there's an expectation that we are knowledgeable on these past events, especially considering the legislation that was created in response to this one study. But what we know is that many of ourselves and our colleagues aren't uh, accurately aware of what happened and or aren't aware of the ongoing and current effect that this one study has on the lack of Black participation in research or the seeking of health services for all Black people, for that matter. 
And just to put that into context, the impact of this one study, the Quarterly Journal of Economics in 2018 published data noting increase in medical mistrust and mortality and a decrease in outpatient and inpatient physician interactions with Black men after the Tuskegee study ended in 1972. So what that's basically saying is that as a result of the Tuskegee study and its reveal, the life expectancy for all Black men in America has fallen from that time by one and a half years in direct response to the national disclosure of the injustices of the Tuskegee study. So we're talking about the article that came out in 1972. So men like my father who knew about the study, but didn't connect it to their own indifference about seeing a doctor or any, or for any reason, um, unless he felt like he was dying, this has had an impact on those men. And so this one study has created enough distress, affiliated and unaffiliated, with no direct relation to the study to have an overall decrease of life expectancy. So that definitely should give you the idea of the impact of this one historical study that we reference, but I don't believe that that statistic is put into context. And yes, the study focused on Black men as the test subjects. However, the whole Black family unit was negatively impacted as a result. And by the end of the study, 40 spouses and 19 children had contracted the disease syphilis, which is directly related to the non-disclosure of uh, results. And then when we bring it into present day, as the COVID vaccination clinical trials have begun to bring to light issues regarding the lack of diversity in research, this time in history continues to make for an influential conversation around the significance, the consequence, and the impact of the Tuskegee study on Black Americans presently, as well as the part that it continues to play in just general research participant demographics. And as medical and research professionals, it is part of our responsibility, along with the PIs, of course, to ensure that research is safe and available to and for all. That being said, the goals, again, to reiterate, are to discuss the facts of the study and to consider ways that we can enhance the research experience for all participants. For me, I would say I've presented this series a few times now, and in this time frame that Brad, you and I are doing it, this has been the first time that I've sat with the less technical aspects of like the violations and, and the issues of the study and identified this space of compassion, like recognizing that it is important for me to have to extend compassion. And that is <clears throat> probably the grander, bigger lesson that I've picked up in in trying to find a way to enhance the research experience for all participants. Compassion for our human participants who give their bodies to us for science. Things we know, but we need to be reminded of. And again, some of these participants, as we know, they're dying. And as they're dying and sitting there with their families, we're asking them questions about their symptoms or comorbidities. and, And they are answering these questions. And so in helping us figure out for the betterment of science, right? And so I feel a great amount of passion and gratitude for their live specimen donation. So I ask that you actively think about how, as you receive this information, how can you make a a positive impact in your day, uh, whether you see participants or not? The ask is that you uh, be a part of the change. Okay, so let's quickly recap the... Previous two episodes, I'm going to go pretty quick. If you want any more detail, that is firmly in episode one and two. But just to give us an idea of where we're headed, since it's been a year, or <laughs> it's been eight months uh, since we've discussed these things, let's go back through it. Okay, so in the 1920s, the U.S. Public Health Service, later known as the CDC, established a special department investigating venereal diseases across the country. In 1931, Macon County, County, Alabama, which is where the Tuskegee Medical Institute is located, later known as Tuskegee University, shout out Tigers, is recognized as having a significantly high rate of syphilis, noticeably among sharecroppers, and this is important, who are mostly poor, illiterate, and Black. This part of the study, this is the first part of the study, which is to identify and treat participants with confirmed disease. The Rosenwald Fund 
which is known for their philanthropic work in the Black segregated South, assisted the public health service in funding this study. But in 1932, due to the Great Depression, the Rosenwald Fund had to drop out. And now this becomes an exclusively PHS public health service study. The study quickly changes. This is when it goes into the second form. And at this point, they are not going to provide treatment or results. And the focus now is to just observe the study, the progression of the study without disclosure completely. The men were never consented or made aware of the aspects of the study and the doctors lied by telling the men that they were receiving treatment when in fact, oftentimes it was a lumbar puncture with no local anesthesia. Additionally, the doctors used the participant's blood, again without consent, to create two diagnostic tests, which are later FDA approved, and we still use them to this day for STD panels. As well as the countless methods and or forms of coercion used throughout the study, you can easily Google images of letters between PIs at that time, confirming in the least their acknowledgement of the human negligence uh, by withholding the treatment and the non-disclosure. And for 33 years, scientists presented their study updates at conferences, and there were no objections of the legitimacy of the study. Until 1972, when Peter Buxton blew the lid on the whole thing, he was a young PHS uh, employee, breaks in July of 1972. And by that time, the response nationally is everybody's basically upset. General public's upset, politicians, doctors, and scientists alike. So in the fall of 1972, in October, the CDC finally shuts down the study. And by that time, we know after 41 years out of the 600 participants, 400 had confirmed syphilis, 200 were controls. Seven of the men died of a direct relation to syphilis. 150 men died of heart related related uh, complications, which is considered like a late stage syphilis associated complication. And from there, a year later, the NAACP files a class action suit on behalf of the men. Uh, They reach a settlement of $10 million, of which the families receive $40,000 each, and they get uh, free health care for the men and their immediate families. However, none of the doctors affiliated uh, with the study are charged or held accountable. In 1997, Bill Clinton delivers an apology speech at the White House in the presence of the remaining survivors. By that time, there's only eight. And in 2017, the families of the survivors requested that the unclaimed $9 million of the original $10 million settlement be used for a museum honoring the victims and the Trump administration denied their request. And so here we are, present day, discussing the actions following the end of the study and the legacy that this one study has left on the field of clinical research with human participants. So let's go back to the summer of 1972. (laughs) I sound like an old person. I sound so old. The summer of 72. Let's go back to the summer of 72. <laughs> then by that point, the CDC has shut down the study and it's the spring of 73. And Edward Kennedy has begun, uh, he's leading the congressional hearings into the study, which ultimately goes into the passage of the National Research Act of 1974. From that creation, we have the National Commission of the Protection of Human Subjects in Biomedical and uh, Behavioral Research, who later goes on to produce what we all know as the Belmont Report. Now, the clinical research professionals out here, y'all should be familiar with this. This is like one of our holy grail doctrines, <laughs> our reference documents that we that we hold so dear in making our decisions. The, from the Belmont report bursts the ethical framework for clinical research in human participants, leading to the establishment of the IRBs, informed consent, and the protection of vulnerable populations. Moving forward in 1993, three months after Bill Clinton's apology speech, there is a movie that is released called Mrs. Ivers Boys. Um, it's in all of the major theaters, and it talks about, or it, it, it's based on the significant role that nurse um, Eunice Rivers played or has on this study, whom we talk about in episode one. The movie doesn't necessarily get into this. Rather, generally, the question is in the research world, 
was she, Eunice Rivers, villain for recruiting the men, gaining their trust while knowing their fate, or by race and profession, would we call her a victim of obedience? And probably, honestly, sadly, both. And additionally, what we also know is that the Tuskegee syphilis study was not the only one of its kind. Uh, I spoke a little bit about this in episode one. Based on government data, the reason why the country was interested in expanding research into venereal diseases was because at the time, the U.S. military was spending $34 million to treat STDs. And I looked into that. Not thirty. $4 $4 million in today's value, but $34 million in, in that time period. And then in the early 1920s was, was when they, uh, was when this data was gathered and there was treatment, but it was often, and it was understudied and not nearly as effective. And so from to, I'm sorry, 1946 to 1948, the Tuskegee study was in full swing, but also there were other U.S. medical doctors and scientists who went to Guatemala in pursuit of further exploration of of an effective treatment for STDs. This was led by John Cutler, who we introduced as a key player in the Tuskegee study in episode one. Him and some other researchers had a plan to test a prophylactic medication, but needed an infected population. So initially, the study was attempted in an Indiana prison, but it was attempted in an Indiana prison by applying the bacteria causing gonorrhea to a prisoner's sex organs. However, the infections weren't fully created and they found that there must be something in the act of sex that made the transmission easier. So Guatemala is selected and for, for all intents and purposes, it's for diplomatic and political relations at that time. And also basically prostitution wasn't illegal as it is in the U.S or as frowned upon as it is in the U.S. So the details of the intentional exposure experience start off by utilizing the prostitutes to increase syphilis and gonorrhea transmission rates in the prisons and with the Guatemalan army. Doctors encouraged the women to have sex with as many prisoners and soldiers as possible, and doctors would alternate sending women to the prison and then off to the military and vice versa. However, the number of positive cases weren't as promising as John Cutler was hoping, and so they moved on to much more sickening ways of infecting prisoners, their military, and even patients of the psychiatric hospital. Again, none of the participants or lack thereof were aware of uh, what they were taking part in. They they weren't consented, and they obviously weren't giving update on their uh, their status of their disease or treatment. In some cases, again, like with the Tuskegee study, there's documented evidence via letters between the PIs that they were aware of the pain that they were inflicting upon their participants and also would share notes on observing the painful end of life process that was associated with a comorbidity like syphilis or gonorrhea. The study wrapped in uh, 1948. Uh, this is around the same time as the widespread approval of penicillin. And so John Cutler at this time jumps off of this study and then goes on to the Tuskegee study in Alabama. And again, there's documented evidence between PIs acknowledging that they need to abandon this study as quickly as possible because there is a change in command at Washington, D.C. And the wording is such that you believe that they know that there is a problem with the conduct of this research. So they need to pack up and get back to the States. And again, lastly, it's worth noting that the Nuremberg Code, which was a governing document that was created by American doctors, implemented in the U.S. around uh, 1947. This is a guidance document that could have been used, should have been used to refer to. And again, this is another one of those holy grail documents that we use in clinical research. For those who aren't familiar, it was created in response to World War II, um, in response to the Nazi doctors conducting brutal 
experimental experiments on the Jewish people in the concentration camps and is aimed to protect human participants from enduring cruelty and exploitation that prisoners endured at the concentration camps. So again, these provisions were in place, they, but they weren't used to protect Guatemalans or Black Americans for that matter, despite the medical experiments being conducted by Americans and it being American funded. The 10 required aspects regarding the medical experiments on human subjects that the Nuremberg Code outlines are as follows. There's 10 of them. And I'm just going to read them quickly. The first one is voluntary consent. The second one is the results of any experiment must be for the greater good of society. Three, human experiments should be based on previous animal experimentation. Four, experiments should be conducted by avoiding physical and mental suffering and injury. Five, no experiments should be conducted if it's believed to cause death or disability. Six, the Risk should never exceed the benefits. Number seven, adequate facilities should be used to protect participants. Number eight, experiments should be conducted by only qualified scientists. Number nine, subjects should be able to end their participation at, at any time. And number 10, the scientist in charge must be prepared to terminate the experiment when injury, disability, or death is likely to occur. Again, these were published in 1947 by the U.S., by U.S. scientists, and for the purposes of the U.S. and the world to use as a reference guide for human research. And as a reminder, the Tuskegee study uh, began in 1931 and was shut down in 1972. So, therefore, with that being said, your mission, should you choose to accept, <laughs> and it should be very easy, is to make a list of the violations that you were able to find in the Tuskegee study. Our final and fourth conversation we'll be having together, we'll dive uh, deeper and look into those violations. Brad and I will explore our final thoughts and our comments related to these topics in the quickly evolving world of clinical research as it is this COVID, post-COVID world. And we will wrap up and include our, we will wrap up and conclude our coverage of the impact of the Tuskegee Tuskegee syphilis study at that time. So this was a quick one. And thank you for your time. See you soon, uh, sooner than last time, I believe. <laughs> and have a great day. As always, thank you for listening to Note to File Podcast. Uh, make sure to check out our previous episodes at notetofilepodcast.com uh, and join us for our live streams Tuesday at noon Eastern on LinkedIn and YouTube. Thanks, guys.